freedom of the city of Vancouver is hereby bestowed upon George Woodcock. It is the highest uh, award the city can give to any of its citizens, so it's not given out freely. And of course, they're, they're making the outsider into, into an insider, aren't they? Yes, and they're but, taking but, but you, me into the city in the most intimate way they can. And you are, but and, but you are accepting this quite consciously. Yes, consciously, and because, so this, because I believe in that connection between freedom and the city. I have still something on my mind. Freedom. It is a word worth repeating, for I have been given what I have been given is by definition a freedom medal. And the great role of cities in the development of our ideals and practice of freedom has not always been recognized or fully understood. In the Middle Ages, the merchants and artisans of Europe created their own free cities on the seacoast and riverbanks of the feudal world. People who lived outside the cities were mostly the vassals or serfs of lords or kings. People in the cities carried on their trade and their industries and practiced their arts in free cooperation and defended themselves through their guilds and fraternities. And when a serf, fleeing from a tyrannical landlord, found his way through the city gates and was accepted, he became a free man in name and in practice. I see this association of the city and of mental and physical freedom as an important, valuable tradition not to be lost. I see myself as a symbolic descendant of that fleeing serf, and that is why I feel such pleasure at becoming a freedom of my own city of Vancouver. Thank you for your attention, your worship, ladies and gentlemen. This is it. The steady, long-term presence of a, of a man of letters. That's, there are lots of people who do books, write books, but there aren't many people of letters, as I think of it. And, and somebody who belongs to a, a, a tradition of, of letters and has all that in his background, and, and manage it to represent it, represent that somehow, in, in without being um, um, what you'd think of as a public, a popular public figure. Um, he represented it in, nonetheless, in everything he did, certainly in the books, in the range of the books, in the steadiness of the books. He refused to be a, a specialist in an age of specialization. Um, his work with, with the uh, Canadian literature, I mean, his creation, really, of Canadian literature, that was certainly known and, and must have been unbelievably supportive to a growing uh, community of writers in this province. When I published Survival in 1972, which is about Canadian literature, there were still a lot of people then who said, why are you writing a book on this? It doesn't exist. So you can imagine what writing a magazine, editing a magazine devoted to this subject in 1959 would have been like. A lot of people saying, this is ludicrous. Why do they have a magazine devoted to this non-existent subject? But for us, the young writers, it was uh, what they now call a very validating thing. And the Canadian literature came along, and Woodcock didn't know all that much about Canadian literature, so he was teaching himself, as he says, Canadian literature as he was going along. Um, but the whole idea that you could do that, have a magazine about Canadian literature, and, and have Canadian writers writing in it, not just professors, uh, started me on my career as a Canadian writer instead of just a writer. I am always impressed by his, um, his reasonableness, his sheer knowledge. The only other person I've known with that kind of knowledge was W.H. Auden. He's influenced me in my work habits. I mean, he shames everybody. You know, he produces so much. It, it always amazes me. Julian Barnes said that uh, the writer in Flaubert's Parrot, he said that the writer must be an outcast by nature and universal in sympathy. And I think that uh, applies very well to George as well. But you know, one of the things that's remarkable about him is, is that he's prolific. And in this country, if you're prolific, it's considered that you're lousy. George Woodcock is not only prolific, but he is good. And he has made, made it easier for some of the rest of us who are accused of turning out too much stuff. I think that, in that sense, he's been a pioneer. 
the third and final volume of your autobiography is forthcoming, what's the title and, and what are we going to find in it? The title is Walking Through the Valley, meaning walking near to death, what the valley of the shadow, of course. And really it's a, it's a summing up to an extent. It's a, an account of things I've done in the last 15 years, but it is also a reflection on a life as a whole. You realize that, in fact, your life as you conceive it is a great fiction. And writing an autobiography, in a way, is elucidating the fiction. I saw you first as a cloud fettered to a tree whose huge gnarled branches draped a long-lived wooden house. We saw the house on the tree, its grey against your white. We bought the house and you continued to inhabit your root-filled habitat. Your branches cracked. Tree surgeons praised your age as they lopped another limb, and you gave half-winters firewood. I ached when I saw it burn. You had become my brother, wakening the year with splendid regularity, marking the lustre. And as your essence failed and fewer boughs bore fruit, I felt my own heart fail. You had become again, as Larry saw his peer. And while I watch your dying, I know my own will follow, and as calmly know it as you in your dryad mind. You know, I used, to, I used to say to him when I'd be busy myself and, and working hard, you know, that my work wasn't going to get done posthumously. He really understood that, you know, and he used to work all night. And, uh, you know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want people wasting time, you know, weeping over him. So we're going to have a party, and I think that's really what George wanted, to have all his friends around and just to talk about their memories with him. This is George's cherry tree on Cherry Street. Feels right to end here. Perhaps with the words of George's oldest friend, the English writer Julian Simmons, who said, I know of nobody who has been of more generous help to others or pursued good ends in life more unswervingly. Thanks for watching Book World. See you next week.